Thank you very much, Leanne. Now, we are going to move to our first focus topic, insurance. I'm delighted to report one of my roles tonight as timekeeper. We are 20 minutes ahead of schedule, which means more time for questions. Um, so Jerry is going to start with an overview of um, the state of play with EQC and insurance, and then we'll have our first question session. Jerry. Well, we're ahead of time because, uh, Leanne, you're a lot briefer than you used to be in the house, I must say. Just to... <laughs> I've also got to say, when I heard you talking about the values that you and the rest of the council had, I thought, who would have believed Leanne Zell, Zell would lead Christchurch on a lurch to the right? But, uh, can I, <laughs> there's a little unfair. Can I also uh, please acknowledge councillors, I'm sorry I didn't do that before, and also my parliamentary colleagues, uh, Ruth Dyson and uh, Nikki Wagner. Uh, both of them have worked very tirelessly, as have most MPs around here, uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, they're very, very strong advocates for their communities and um, I, they certainly spend a lot of time uh, talking to me. Um, <laughs> I think it's worth noting too that in that uh, diagram we put up at the start, it had um, uh, the uh, cross-party forum, which essentially looks at a lot of things, but one of the things it does that's most important is looks at orders and councillors. We've had to set aside for a time some laws and replace them with other lawful activities. Uh, that goes through a process where all parties get to have a say on that, uh, as does the committee forum, and we have a panel of people uh, outside of that uh, who uh, have a degree of expertise led by Sir John Hanson to advise on that as well. And Parliament hasn't turned down that opportunity once. So when uh, you know, we talk about the you know, the government being here, I have to acknowledge that the whole of the, department is, uh, of the Parliament is behind the recovery here as well. Um, I, I do need to acknowledge Darren Wright, who's here tonight also as the uh, informal chair of the Community Forum. The Community Forum has been, I think, quite outstanding in uh, considering uh, various recovery documents um, and giving us very solid feedback, and I think, Darren, we've taken every bit of advice that you've given us and, and written those into those documents. Turning now to the issue of uh, insurance, just want to, um, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people here who can answer questions with some expertise, but I want to look at two particular problems that we have had to deal with over time uh, and continue in some cases to deal with. The first is the issue of apportionment, which I know has had some people quite exercised. New Zealand is quite unique in that we have very high levels of insurance. We think that it's as much as 99 plus percent of New Zealanders insure their homes. But through any given insurance period, there'll be a range of reinsurance contracts that sit over and above uh, the guarantees of those policies. And in the end, it's those reinsurers, or perhaps even above that, a facultative layer that will pay the money out to settle their claims. So they don't want to find out that they are paying out for something at a time when they're not on risk. So when you've had this uh, huge accumulation of claims, over 750,000 claims, because we've had multiple events over that time, where you get uh, you know, someone claiming for the 4th of September, then they get more damage on the 22nd of February and so on, and appropriately uh, a claim is put in, but there is a need to work out who is liable for what at that time. And that's not been a simple exercise. Uh, we tried to get a simple way through it, uh, but there was a, a court decision that told us how to do it, which frankly took a lot longer. Um, then there is the issue of, uh, oh, just get this right, the multiple units. And this is a very, very difficult one. Uh, I don't know if there's any lawyers in the room, but frankly, uh, the, I suppose, setting aside of body corporate laws here in Christchurch over a long period of years. Uh, as there has been a conveyance of a multiple unit or a unit inside a multiple structure to a different owner, I think uh, is a pretty uh, damning indictment on the legal profession, quite frankly. Because what it's meant is that over time, uh, where you might have on one title several units, you also end up with several insurers. And in that example that's behind you, uh, on the screen I should say, I've just nominally put some names there. I'm not trying to pick on anybody here, believe me. But if, uh, if you look at this, and you've got the one on, the, on, the, on your, your right, uh, your left, sorry, with uh, under $100,000 damage, but the one next to it over, and then the one under and one over, to fix any one of them, 
you've either got to damage one other or damage them all. And the question simply becomes, who pays? And if you layer over the top of that all of the reinsurance arrangements, it's not easy to unpick. And I think uh, that there has, well, I know that there has been a huge amount of work uh, go into trying to sort that issue out. I understand that some uh, very broad resolutions are available and someone from the insurance industry might, might speak on that shortly, although it's difficult because they've all got their own interests, obviously, uh, and, and I'm not saying that in any uh, pejorative way, it's just the reality of it. Taking a, a look at uh, exactly what we're dealing with, so I said at the start 744,000 claims across four major events. You can see the, the uh, uh, breakdown of those, those that are still open as claims, those that are closed. Uh, Bruce Empson is running a team that's trying to uh, put all of those claims on each property into uh, a single bucket so that it can be dealt with uh, more easily. Uh, but those 428,000 uh, closed claims is no small achievement. 172,000 properties were affected. 147 are being managed through the EQC under cap below $100,000 damage area. If you think back to what I said at the start, where one of the predictions was that our real estate values would fall through the floor, uh, we convinced EQC uh, to undertake that uh, managed approach for two reasons. One, you may recall immediately after September and then certainly after February 22nd, there were all sorts of people running around town charging $70 an hour to take down chimneys and all sorts of other things. Some horrible stories about uh, vulnerable people having someone knock on their door saying they had to get something done and then presenting them with a very large bill. That would have had, if it had just continued unabated and without some control around it, a very adverse effect on the uh, psyche of the community in my view. But it would also have created uh, significant inflationary pressures uh, and would never have given a, a point where someone can say, my house was damaged in this earthquake or these earthquakes, it's now been repaired and it's repaired under this system and there's a line under it. It's very interesting to note a lot of real estate uh, advertising at the moment says EQC com uh, repairs completed and that is being stated as a mark of confidence. And I think we can't underestimate how useful that will be in that long term. When Leanne talks about resilience, uh, that's one of the things that will contribute to our long-term resilience, in my view. Um, the uh, home repair program, as you can see, uh, should be completed uh, toward the end of next year. That's one year sooner than was uh, predicted, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm very confident that they'll be able to stick to that timeline. Uh, when it comes to... Sorry? Oh. Yeah, OK, well, look... Um, you know, I come from a world where everything does, every, everyone else does something for you, so I, I'm very... <laughs> it's a long time since I managed any tools myself, I must say, so if I had to swing a hammer now, I'd have no fingers on my right hand because I'm left-handed, but... Okay, so of those uh, damaged homes, 24,660 uh, properties that are over cap. Uh, some of them are for repair, some of them are for rebuild. And uh, 10,000 of those properties, about 41%, the moment are fully completed. 11,200 properties are in a process. In other words, people are engaged with their insurer and working things through. Some will say not all satisfactorily, but nonetheless, there's an engagement. And those settlement rates should increase as they are more and more are resolved uh, as we move, it will be, into 2015. But if you look at the breakdown, Southern Response with about a third of the market. I'd like to make some comments about that in a minute. Um, IAG, uh, with their various brands, about a third of the market, and other insurers taking uh, collectively roughly the other third. So Southern Response is the government-owned uh, insurer. Uh, you certainly wouldn't call it an asset. Um, AMI was a mutual insurance company that effectively offered competitive rates in the market, but never provided for the bad day. So when the bad day occurred, they were uh, some billions of dollars short on being able to make their payments. Now we could have, I suppose, said, well, that's unfortunate. People chose a dud insurer. Uh, they will go west. But that's not been our approach. So what we did is took the, uh, the good book, if you like, the ongoing customer base. We were able to sell that. 
Those proceeds have gone towards uh, a fund which will include some reinsurance, but a big, big government contribution, probably in the billions, to pay out those insurance claims uh, through Southern Response, which effectively is a run-out insurer. But it is a lesson for people who say that, some, that, that always local is best. If you get my drift, I'll say no more than that. Um, I think the uh, important point to note, though, through Peter Rose and his team, they have offers to 94% of their customers, uh, decisions made by 86% of them, and 37%, which obviously includes the 86 have fully settled. So progress there, and I'm sure that the progress for uh, other insurers will be the same. What that gives you, though, is you know, right now a... Um, picture that says more than half of all the Canterbury earthquake residential dwelling claims have been resolved, 59% of undercap claims have been resolved and 41% of overclap have been resolved. So we would expect that some of the uh, acceleration that you've seen over the last six months is going to continue to accelerate over the next uh, uh, 18 months to get to a position where we're going to see um, a, a great deal more uh, people completely satisfied or completely settled. EQC have completed 46,420 repairs. I'm not convinced that had we just left it to uh, uh, people to ring up the local builder or whoever and get them round, that we would be so far down the track. And just making a final comment on that, one of the things that also drove us is that in another part of New Zealand where there was a much, much, much smaller earthquake, there was a range of settlements done by EQC uh, where the cheque turned up in the mail and suddenly the cracks and the stretches and the twists and everything else that goes with earthquake damage didn't quite look so bad, but the stock room at Harvey Norman and the brochures at Will Travel looked pretty good. The upshot of that is that there was, uh, in a very short time, an adverse number of house fires in that uh, particular part of the country, largely due to unrepaired un insur insurance work. So you've just got to watch that property value stuff all the way through because of the type of society uh, that we are. So um, I'm not sure how you want to handle things, Mike. Do you want some questions now about this? Absolutely. They'll be gagging for it. Right. Um, so now we've got four roving mics. I'm not a rover, but there are two on each stairway. So if you have a question on insurance that you can either direct Jerry, and Jerry is, <clears throat> of course, able to defer to uh, one of the many representatives we have uh, from the insurance industry. Uh, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, one of the rovers will come your way. Insurance questions, people. Who wants to lead away? Yes. Thank you, Minister. This is on. Uh, Paul O'Neill, Community Law. We've seen something in the order of 10,000 or more than 10,000 clients uh, since the earthquake, so we, we know a little bit of what's happening out there in, in all respects, plus the social cost. Can I ask of the Minister that he requires of, not requests, but requires of EQC that they engage openly, they share information, they attend meetings, they negotiate, and we would advance this so much more quickly. The reality is there is no reason why clients or people cannot get their own information, cannot attend with an advisor a meeting where an EQC representative turns up, and I'd like you to request to them that they honour an open and honest commitment to our community. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'll take that on board. You don't wish to elaborate any further? Well, I don't think you can elaborate much further than that. Yeah. It means I heard that man stand up and tell me that there are 10,000 cases that have been through community law where he believes that had there been better engagement with EQC, those issues could have been more quickly resolved. Well, what I'm, what I'm looking at is the uh, very large number of issues that are resolved through EQC, and they well outweigh the 10,000. There will always be difficulties. But what I want to do say is this, that... Um, uh, for me to make a blanket statement about my expectations of EQC without recognising the successes of EQC would be frankly irresponsible. I don't want EQC making people's life difficult. And that's not... Well, well, OK. Yep. Well, that's... Uh, well, Paul, all I can say is 
Thank you for your views. I can take that on board and I'll discuss that with EQC. All right. Yeah. Next question, please. A rover will find you. Uh, yep. Here you go. To your right. Um, I saw that you put up that 97% of Southern Response um, customers have been offered um, some money to settle. Um, how many of those are in line with their policy? Um, there are somewhere in the region of 100 litigants out there at the moment. And just another statistic for you, uh, as of last month, only 203 reinstatements, that's rebuilds and repairs, completed. Well, uh, Peter, do you want to make a comment on that? Come forward to that over the far side there. Can I just make one small comment? When we've settled red zone properties, so around about uh, 7,000 settled so far, we've discovered more than 80 different types of insurance policy. And you can't underestimate how difficult that uh, 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 can create a problem, how, how much of a difficulty that can be, particularly if you have, say, 10 people in a street uh, and uh, they see people treated in a different fashion. Uh, unfortunately, one of the, the hard lessons that comes out of this is we all need to read our insurance policy. So I'm just not offering that as an excuse. I'm just saying that is a reality of also what we're dealing with. Peter. I'm sorry, you have to ask the question again, Blues. Oh. How many of your 97% uh, have been, in fact, it's 97 percent I understand is engagement with uh, people. They, they used, you How many of those have been engaged to... on the basis of the policy? Okay, you ask the question again if you like. So you said the 97 percent of people had had offers, but what I wanted to know is how many of those are in line with their policies, um, because there appears to be a high number of litigants out there already, no. for those of those people that can actually afford to litigate against Southern Response, I would suggest that a high number of those offers are so low that they're not being accepted by people. Well, at this point of time, we have about 250 matters under dispute, and those matters don't have to be dealt with through court, so there's no cost to the, to the customer. Uh, we're expecting a dispute rate in the order of about 7.5%, which we think, by, you know, in, all, in all respects, that's not too bad. Uh, as far as we're concerned, Every customer has been provided an offer in terms of their insurance policy. If it's incorrect, we, we'll review it. We don't stand on our metal at all. We, we review, we, we revise. Um, of all those cases that are either into the build or have been built, about one and a half DRAs, that's the assessment, have been undertaken. So we don't just stick to our guns and say well, once and once only. Um, we, um, we do negotiate and we... Um, and we, we can concede when necessary, but um, a, a dispute rate at present of about 3.5% we think is pretty good, and we think in total there'll be about 7.5% disputes. Jackie, do you want to say Do you want to speak one more? Just very briefly, yep. Sorry, we're going to need the microphone. Just a very quick follow-up, please. Just quickly. In response to that, Peter Rose, um, allegedly you're paying Arrow uh, a million per week. How can you rely on them to independently verify the DRA? Their role is to accurately and I guess religiously assess the DRA. We're not trying to do it to save money, we're trying to do it to come up with a fair and reasonable figure to either repair or rebuild. They've been given no instructions other than to come up with the reasonable figure. Okay, next question. Yes. Uh, Peter Rose, would you like to stay there? <laughs> well, hang on, hang on, we'll just hit the question first. Um, just referring to what he's just stated about they're quite happy to discuss, we had a second opinion done, which was 300,000 difference from the Arrow DRA. We got the letter saying that to do a reassessment, we have to sign a document that says they have the right to turn us into a repair or lower their figure. Now, I find that straight out threatening, that take what we're giving you or we'll make it worse. Now, if that's called negotiating, um, it's not my definition. Do you have a comment, Peter? We do take that stand if there has been, I guess, ongoing disputation with the customer as ter in terms of the value. The way we've assessed claims is that if the cost of... of um, 
a repair, of a repair is more than 80% of the rebuild cost, we will, we will make that a rebuild. However, if the value of the rebuild goes up well above that figure, then our 80% figure becomes, becomes higher as well. So there's a prospect that the house can be repaired. And if it's repairable, what's wrong with that? Okay. Next question, please. Uh, we'll go right down the front here. Yep, third row. Yes. Just, just Sorry, hold on one moment. Your microphone. Day, assessing damage to people's homes and going into homes where EQC have done repairs, Southern Response have done assessments. What I find on a constant basis is number one, the um, initial assessments done by EQC and Southern, um, Southern Response staff is unqualified. It's done by people without qualifications who in fact are stating that they're licensed practitioning builders well, like licensed building practitioners, and when we in fact look them up, they're not at all. Um, and what I'm finding is that can there I, is a lot of a, sorry, cosmetic I, sorry, repair just ask, which is failing. Yeah, sorry, can I just ask who you represent? I, I represent earthquake services, but I've tried, I'm architecturally trained. Okay. okay. And I've worked within the construction industry for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the structural damage to homes is being completely ignored by EQC, Fletcher's staff and Southern Response staff, and I'm seeing this time and time again on a daily basis, where people are forever being offered cosmetic repair, they're shifting back into their homes, where their ceilings have had asbestos, um, sanded off their ceilings, and, and the, the houses aren't being tested, and they're shifting back into their homes with asbestos sorry, sorry. through their homes. If I could just okay. ask... Who the, the, uh, sorry, ma'am, we're just we're going to have to keep this ticking yeah, over, so I'll just need Jerry respond. What, what, what is, what it, is sorry, going to be done to yeah, audit on. this but, this disrepair of homes? Well, can you tell us who Earthquake Services is? Well, that's no, not irrelevant. Who is it? Sorry. What do you mean by who is it? Well, well, what what is it? Is it a government agency? Is no, it a private agency? Right. Okay. Thank you. No, I don't know who it is. Never I'm heard sure of it. I'm sure you know who it is. Well, well, why don't you wait for the microphone? Yeah, hold on, hold on, Brian. We are just dealing with this lady so, here first. Jerry, do you want? No, no, I, I'm not uh, able to answer that. But uh, what I would ask is that uh, people who is there, who who here can answer the question. How would the situation arrive where EQC had repaired a, f a home, but Southern Response uh, had missed some damage to that home? I think was. Well, I think Ian, you might like to uh, comment on that. Well, that's your opinion. Let, me, let Mr. Simpson speak about how that how it actually works. So I think a number of um, statements there. Um, the first one is in terms of the assessment teams. So as you know, this, the assessors go out in pairs. So we'll have one person who's the assessor who doesn't need to be trade qualified. He'll help the homeowner through the claim process and through the paperwork. And then an estimator who does have a, a, a trade profession, he'll go through the house and actually give a co the costed uh, co scope of works back to EQC. So the people are in pairs. Um, in terms of only cosmetic when there's structural damage, um, we've, through the repair process, we've got about 80 to 90% satisfaction through the, with those repairs when, when we call homeowners and get their, their response. Um, I would absolutely dispute that there's, there's any systematic approach where we're missing structural damage. That's not why we put the home repair program together. All right, thank you very much, Ian. Next question, yes, straight away. Question for Peter Rose. Mr. Rose, I'm interested in your comments about liability or rather responsibility that Southern Response has to the taxpayer. Uh, when I read that comment, and I've uh, read and heard it a couple of times, I wondered how you balance the responsibility to the taxpayer with the responsibility to the policyholder. Yeah, it's a bit of a tightrope, wheel, really. So what that means from, from our viewpoint is that we respond to AMI, AMI's policy conditions accurately and, and uh, religiously. Uh, we don't pay more than the entitlements. We, do, we seek not to pay less. And from, uh, from Mr Brownlee's viewpoint, uh, he will fund us for the deficit 
uh, over and above that which is the entitlements to AMI uh, policyholders. So uh, there's, there's no way we're trying to screw back at all, but we do recognise that um, we, we take a firm and fair approach to our, to our settlements because of our obligations to policyholders, which we, we don't suggest is any greater than insurers' obligations to reinsurers, but this is home and this is where it really matters. All right, thank you very much. Moving on, next question. Where are we? I'll go down the front first, and then we'll go up. Yep. Mr. Brownlee, you mentioned about um, multi-dwelling uh, buildings and the difficulty of assessing uh, w ways forward for claims on those. Um, I, I have been involved in a few of those um, issues, and um, it seems to me it's been months and months and months now that we've been told over and over and over again the difficulties what I'm looking for is some way forward to resolving uh, those issues, and that doesn't seem to be coming forward. How well, are we doing on that? What, what progress are we making, and what progress, when can we expect to see further progress in the resolve in relationship to those multi-dwelling buildings? Thank you. Well, I do know that uh, uh, along with uh, uh, Sarah, there's been a lot of discussion with insurers. In the end, uh, there's going to be an unders and overs exercise, uh, and and We've got, we're going to be in a position of asking someone to uh, probably take a little bit more on, uh, and it's a matter of who's going to lead those things. But Tim Grafton from the Insurance Council will happily give us an update on that progress. Uh, yes, uh, EQC and uh, the insurance have uh, got together. We've had an expert uh, loss adjuster uh, who led a leading uh, company in New Zealand to put together a methodology for approaching these multi unit properties. So what we have now is a data sharing exercise that uh, is exchanging information between EQC and insurers. We have an approached methodology which will see a lead insurer lead on a multi-property, uh, probably the one with the biggest skin in the game. Uh, and they will take that through and have their PMO uh, manage the repairs on that building. But there are issues there that uh, people need to be cognizant of. And that is, as the Minister alluded to earlier, under the legal uh, setup that we have, it requires every property owner in that multi-unit uh, space to be agreeing with every aspect of that repair. So to some extent, there are insurance issues that we are addressing that are going to move on, but also it will require the shared commitment of all those property owners to commit to provide the solutions to move forward there. But the good news is, is we are progressing very well with that. We are recruiting the teams of loss adjusters over the next uh, few weeks, and uh, movement on that will be starting before the end of this year. So some good news on that front. Just to uh, restate again that had uh, all of those multiple units had an active body corporate with a single insurance, the problems we have wouldn't exist. So it's failure over a very long period of time. Big button? Right, okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's not the multi problem. I can't answer that for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, you, can ask, you can ask that question, but in the end, if a, a property is conveyed to someone uh, and a bank insists that there's an insurance policy, uh, you'd think that the reason why you pay a conveyancing fee is for all of the aspects that should be considered in the transfer of that property uh, being put in front of you. Right, next question. Yes, uh, where are we? We'll go, sorry, we'll go over to the left first and then we'll go to you. Yes. Uh, Victor Catamol, I'm a consumer advocate that's helped a lot of people with their insurance issues. Um, you mentioned a myriad of reinsurers and whatever. Uh, quite frankly, that's not the homeowner's concern. They have a relationship with an insurance company and that should be the relationship. EQC, uh, you also mentioned, sir, that um, people should read their policy. And I've been in hundreds of houses and I've probably read most of the 80 policies that you referred to. And none of them state that the insurance company's liability starts once the EQC cap has been reached. They generally, 
they generally all say words to the effect that the insurance company's liability will start once the EQC have assessed their, or that the insurance company will pay the difference between what EQC will pay and their entitlement under the policy. And N. Simpson's already been quoted in the press of saying that the issue is that there is a difference between entitlement and the policies of what EQC offer and what the insurers offer. So the EQC and this whole thing would move along a lot better if EQC would say, we've assessed our liability on this property at 56,000, the homeowner thinks it's more, Mr. Southern Response, Mrs. IAG or whoever, we're handing it over to you. We will pay our 56,000. The rest is your problem. Okay. Jerry, well, what do you think um, of that? Yeah, hang on a minute. Uh, that's, but that's not how the law works. That's what the, contract uh, the, the, the contract is bound by law as well. So you can't, you can't contract out of the law in this country. It's not possible. I can't write a contract that will allow me to do illegal things, nor can insurers. So I think uh, if you want a further clarification on that, I'm happy to ask uh, Ian again to make a response. So the question is, Ian, if you say it's 56,000, the homeowner says, no, it's not, it's more, why don't you just hand the private insurer to sort out the difference? Um, because I think we do need to look at the overall system. So I think we do need a first split of uh, um, the cost between EQC and the insurance industry. Um, and I recognise you say that... Um, the view of the reinsurance industry doesn't matter to people in New Zealand, but it absolutely does. We need to keep the confidence of those international reinsurers who are paying just to EQC the best part of $5 billion into the, Canterbury, the cost of the Canterbury recovery. That's what New Zealand spends on law and order and defence combined every year. So it's a huge number. And without that ongoing support, we will not be able to get affordable new, uh, insurance in New Zealand. So it's important that we need to uh, combine, those, uh, um, combine, combine our approach. Um, I can't answer in terms of what the legal, uh, the legal status of that, of, of passing the claim over is, only to say that you know, in the vast majority of cases, we are reaching that agreement and we are getting on with the repair and fixing the house. Tim, I don't know if you have a view on... And that there are reasonable policy. thresholds at the top end, but not that far down. And why, why would the insurer suddenly want to take that on? It's not, it's not their liability, despite what you say. I'm telling you what the law is. The policy entitlement is different between EQC and what the insurance company have sold to people. EQC want to stitch a floor back together because it's broken, and Southern Response have said, we'll give you a new one. There's a big difference. EQC's liability well, well, may not all, be respect, to give them a new uh, floor. With all due respect, Victor, uh, I'd be very interested to, to take offline an example of that. But it seems to me that the law is very, very clear. EQC is responsible for the first $100,000 plus GST, and when it goes over that amount, uh, then it is handed to the private insurer. That's not what the contracts is, say. Well, it's, it's not the private insurer's contract that we're dealing with. It's the law. But you said people need to read their contract. They yes. have a contract well, with the insurance company. Well, That's what they want to enforce. Gonna, look, we can split hairs if you like, but there well, is not, no it's contract. A, it's, it's, that we what are, you're saying then is the whole insurance industry has defrauded the public of, Christ, of Christchurch in well, New I, Zealand <laughs> for years. Well... Personally, Mr. Catamol, I wouldn't get into that topic, but uh, what I would say is simply this, that you cannot have a contract that contracts out of the law. Simple. Okay. Right. Thank you. Right. We, uh, the, the, look, I'm sorry, someone just yelled out, I'm wrong. <coughs> I'm not wrong. I'm dealing with this across the country on numerous claims that EQC deal with all the time. I know what the Act of Parliament says. I know how it triggers, and I know how it interfaces with the, uh, with, uh, the private insurers. And the first $100,000 worth of damage plus GST belongs to EQC. They have no basis to require a private insurer to step in until they have determined that it goes over the cap. That's been one of our issues. OK. Sorry, ma'am, we're moving on. Question over here. Yes. Hello, um, I'm Neil Hawkins, I'm a private landlord. Um, just in relation to the uh, multi-unit dwellings, is Mr Simpson aware that his staff are putting 
uh, buildings that are owned by one person with one insurer in the multi-unit dwelling category. Um, so yes, I am aware of that. And there's a separate category here, which is, um, uh, it's a problem that we did create, which is when we first assessed all the properties in, in, uh, in Canterbury, including the multi-dwellings, we'd assess the individual dwelling within the, within the property. So as the minister said earlier, if at one end of the property you've got cosmetic damage, but on the other end of the property the foundation's gone and the whole place is a complete rebuild, we were assessing on the basis that it was $15,000 of cosmetic damage at the end of the, end of the property. Now, we've now, through the work we've been doing, realized actually that doesn't make sense. So we are going back out and reassessing those, and where the whole structure needs to come down, we are now reassessing at a full cap payment for that, for that property. So there's some work we've had to do, because we've taken, to be fair, a more sensible approach to, to the liability for the property and how we're taking it forward. All right, thank you very much. Next question, right up the back, yes. Oh, hi there. Um, look, my question is around the OIA and getting information from the EQC. Um, I'm just wondering why you would have to apply under the OIA for very basic, simple information, things like um, requesting the names of people who have visited your property and undertaken assessments, or perhaps their qualifications, um, and also the minutes for the community forum. Um, why would anyone have to apply under the OIA to get those? Well, on the community forum, they're actually put up on the CERA website, so there's no problem with that. Um, they're available all the time. The, uh, on the other issue, I'll get you into, once again, make a comment about that. Um, so clearly we're trying to minimise the amount of um, uh, requests that come through the OIA process, given that we've... Uh, uh, we've been struggling with the volume of requests that we've uh, we've been having. Having, excuse me. I mean, specifically on the um, on the names of um, assessors and uh, people who come to the property, we do want to think about um, privacy concerns for our own staff. Um, but in and you know, so what we're trying to move to is a case where, the, again, we still, in terms of a costed scope of work, which I know often often comes up. That's part of our process for making sure we get a fair price for the job. So we need to look at that. When, you, when if people are asking for the entire claim file, you know, there could be comments about a neighbour's property. We need to go through a process to make sure we're only releasing information that relates uh, to your property. Ian, while you're there, can I just uh, inquire, uh, just wearing my media hat, the minister was quoted in uh, the news last week saying that um, Clayton Cosgrove's OIA has triggered 22 of your staff uh, to be deployed full-time to processing his OIA request. Is that correct? 22 full-time staff? It was a very, very broad um, OIA request uh, covering a hell of a lot of information. So it's, it's taken, I can't remember how many hours it's taken so far, but it's taken a hell of a lot of work to get that, uh, to try and pull that information together. Yes. And 22 staff are working full-time doing it? Um, I'm not sure the exact number of staff. If that's what my team have told the minister, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's the, that's the right number. But it's taken a huge amount of time to pull that together. All right. Next question. Where's the next rover? Um, over here. Yes. Just Thanks. down here. Hello. Um, if you have to, if you want to uh, build or rent commercial property, it has to pass a code compliance every year to, to be carry on and use. Now, there is a lots of cases where insurers are giving people the option of a rebuild or they're offering to buy them out. And, and a lot of people are choosing to take the money and essentially run, which has brought a new investor or a new breed of investor, which uh, houses that are sold as is, where is. So in other words, they're uninsurable houses but the people are quite free and at liberty to rent them out for other people to live in. Now, I live in the Easter Christchurch, and if I look outside of my front window, I can see f at least four properties, possibly five, that are now as is, where is rentals. And I guess my question is a future question, and it's, it's more about the legacy for the city and what we've got going forward, is does New Zealand Incorporated, how does New Zealand Incorporated feel long-term about people having houses that you can't insure, 
but don't meet the, the current codes. They're outside the DBH guidelines. Yeah, look, I, I, all I can say is I think that is a problem that is uh, certainly emerging and one that we need to uh, put a great deal of thought into uh, and then have some solutions for. I can't say more than that tonight. I think it's uh, one of those things that, you know, a wee while ago people were saying that TC3 properties, which is in the main what we're talking about, would end up with no value. And it's uh, slightly, um, you know, a problem that people are now finding value in those, those properties. And, Frankly, some of the prices being paid for them, uh, they barely stack as rentals, let alone uh, uh, possible uh, repair and everything else. So, yeah, it's a problem that we're going to have to look at. Yeah, I think, I think the danger is that I wouldn't say you'd create a shanty town, but you're going no. halfway towards that. And I think maybe for the future... It is, it is actually counter to the expectation that we'll get from the, uh, the managed repair programme and then the, the efforts of the private insurers. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Where are we? Yep. Yeah, there's a significant problem here with the, with the land, and, and uh, that is actually what caused most of the problems here. Uh, we've had significant land subsidence. There are properties which are Category 8 and Category 9. Uh, EQC has done nothing in hindering the insurance companies uh, progressing with cash settlements, uh, without any land remediation. How can you, how can you uh, see that this is a, a rectifiable decision? Well, when that property does come up for repair, they're going to have to meet the uh, standards that are required for uh, new foundations and, yeah. um, and, and, and to make that house uh, stable. So, uh, look, there'll be a range of circumstances where uh, you're, you're talking about around the issue of EQC settling the land. Can I just make this comment? Firstly, New Zealand is quite unique in that we do uh, enable homeowners to ensure the land that their house is built on. It's not a blanket insurance, as some people portray it. Uh, it's formulaic, and it's based on the size of the house and the footprint of that house. Um, and what EQC have tried to do, uh, to be fair to everybody, is to get as many categories inside the worst damaged um, uh, land. So I think it's, uh, Ian will correct me, but I think it's from categories one through to nine. Now, not, it's not a progression of, uh, of damage. It's like they are, each of those categories is a statement of damage. In other words, it might be uh, increased propensity to, to liquefaction in a future event. Uh, it could be some other movement in the land uh, Ian, do you want to speak about any of those particular issues? Yeah, well, we are like moving that. towards settlement, but in the meantime, uh, that the future use of that property uh, will be determined by that category and by the uh, technical standards that come up for any future building on that property. How can, you, how can you repair the house first and the foundations and then fix the land if the land has subsided and is below sea level? Well, if you look, you better see me off, offline and tell me about where those cases exist. I uh, can't know where. It, there, sorry. There, are, there are 140 no, no, sorry. properties. There are 140 properties in South Brighton which have subsided in excess of 250 millimetres. No, no, hold on just a minute. Yep. Just back the bus up a wee moment. So, what we do know is that the whole movement in Christchurch has been in that vicinity. So, we've had the Port Hills that are now around about 700 millimetres higher than they used to be. Uh, and on average, the, uh, the flat land. Uh, has fallen by around that 200 mark. In some places, it's fallen by as much as 1.8 metres. So we're not trying to hide anything there, and that's, there's nothing uh, uh, new or particularly um, uh, concerning in that particular figure. Uh, what it does do is challenge us around the future hydrology of the city, uh, and that's another body of work that we just simply have to carry out. It's exactly the issue. There are, there are these 140 properties which have subsided in, in excess of 250 millimetres. And they are below sea level. The groundwater is extremely well, no, high. No, I'm sorry, they're not below sea level. Oh, yes. No, they're be not. Below, below the high tide mark. No, no, they won't be below Within the high tide Within the coastal mark. marine area. I'm sorry. Below 10.8 metres. Sorry, we've done one of the most extensive geological studies across any residential areas in the world throughout the city. And one of the basis is for bases for term, determining uh, the red areas, the areas where it's unadvisable 
uh, to live was to assess uh, that very issue along with other ground conditions. Uh, but we did not leave people stranded below sea level. Out of these 140 properties, not a single one has been raised. Okay. Yeah, but I you're saying they're below sea level. They are not below sea level. They're below the high tide mark, below well, 10.8 well, metres. I'm sorry, I, I dispute that. I, I'm, look, I, I get I, all of the I information show, I'll, about I'll, the whole I'll sea. I'll bring that to you. Okay. Well, I've got a statement from Tonkin and Taylor in this regard. The Mayor is keen to have a comment on this, and then we'll get Ian to comment as well. I want to comment because it is an issue that I referred to in, in my commentary, which was in relation to the district plan review. We have to address the flooding issues, and there are different ways sure. that we, yep. we, we, we need to do this. Um, the first thing that we need to do is we, want to, we, we, we need to go through a shared learning exercise, which is actually about getting to understand people's local knowledge and their experience of living in these environments coupled with the expert knowledge, because the expert knowledge certainly, um, the Minister is absolutely right in terms of the degree of investigation that our land has been subjected to. But what we need to do is we actually need to um, get all of that expert knowledge. We actually need to go through the different areas that are now um, subject to the risk, and we know about South Brighton, we know about the Flockton Cluster, uh, we know about other areas that are now subject, but in your particular instance and others, they are now below the 50-year return period for the Building Act um, mm, coverage, which is a serious issue because we're not talking about the 200-year return, we're talking about the 50-year return. So what we have to do as a council, and it really is a council issue as opposed to a government issue, which is why I've stepped up to the mic, is that what we have to do is we have to look for what are the technical solutions, so what are the area-wide solutions that we can provide that can protect those properties? Because if individual properties can't be mitigated by lifting up the finished floor levels, then really it comes back to the council, what can we do on an area-wide basis to provide that protection? That then takes us to another area, which is that there are gonna be some areas, if we cannot provide area-wide protection, then we have to have a hard conversation about retreat. And that is a very, very difficult conversation to have, but we need to go through it carefully and work very closely with the residents because, you know, basically we will be telling people that it's not a place that we want to continue residential um, uh, dwellings. If every single area, uh, uh, every single house in that area was going to have to be rebuilt, then they w we could address it with finished floor levels and the type of housing. All of those things could be addressed. But I'm not going to stand by and see people forced to repair their houses when we know that we're going to put them at that level of flood risk. Ian. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about what we used to call Category 8 and Category 9. We're now um, calling uh, increased risk of liquefaction in a future earthquake and increased risk of flooding as a result of the earthquake. Um, you know, just to start, there is an interpretation of our Act which we're not taking, but there is an interpretation that says you know, for a lot of parts of the eastern suburbs, the land was prone to liquefaction before the earthquakes, and, and it was on the limbs, so it was notified on the limbs that there was liquefaction risk. The land liquefied during the earthquakes, and then it reset, and it's now still prone to liquefaction. So actually, it is, it, it, it is what it was before the earthquakes, so nothing's changed. So that, that was an interpretation. So what we've done over the past two years is actually invest a huge amount of time, first of all, to understand what has actually happened to that land. So all the boreholes that were dug and all the data that we've shared and all the geotechnical work that we've had done is to help us understand how has the risk of liquefaction changed as a result um, of the earthquakes. And the model that's been developed by Tonkin and Taylor is unique. It's advanced the science on liquefaction worldwide. It's been published worldwide. So we now know more about the land in Canterbury than probably anywhere else in the world in terms of liquefaction risk. We then also had to do a huge amount of work to prove that we could justify our act uh, responding to that change in risk. So we actually had a legal ability to pay out for those uh, changes in risk. And that's what we've done. So we've got to that point that we will cover change in liquefaction risk and we will pay out. But then, of course, the question, well, what do we pay out? How do you re re 
re-stiffen the land, if you like, back to its state it was in before the earthquakes. And that's what the land trials are now doing, which is actually testing in the red zone techniques that aren't used in a residential setting. Because anywhere else in the world you don't have land cover, and so this has never been done before. So we have to find some sort of technique that can work within a residential setting and confine spaces and let us get that land back to, a re back to its prior state, then we know that when we do settle the claim, we're paying money that can be physically used to get that work done. So that's what with all the work we've been doing. You've seen the trials going through, we had some stuff on TV recently. So by the end of this year, we should have a consentable set of techniques that are in a marketplace where people go out and actually get that, um, that work done. Um, on category nine, I think the mayor um, talked about um, and the issues there, so the increased uh, uh, chance of flooding. Also need to point out there's a difference between the council flood zones for category nine, which include global warming and changes in rainfall and changes in river depths and river mouths. That's, what, that's one set of uh, flooding risk. And then there's the flooding risk that EQC covers, which is only due to the change in the height of your land. So even if there was some way of raising the house to back to where it was before the earthquake, it's still probably in the floodplain, it probably still needs more work. So that's where we are trying to work with the insurers and, and council about what is the best overall solution for this line. Because the other thing to remember is we only cover eight meters around the house. You know, there are these crazy outcomes where you get little Venice around the place with mounds of raised earth with water between them, between the houses. So we need to look at, to a broader solution. And we need to find ways of compensating homeowners where, you know, within reasonable bounds, that, um, that physical repair just doesn't make sense. So that's the work we've been trying to do. We aim to get as that, the, um, the technical, sensible work, test work done by the end of this calendar year. Okay. I'm sorry, we've got to move on. Uh, we'll have one more question in this segment. Don't worry, though, if you've got an insurance question, we can take more on the general session at the end. We'll just take one more insurance question, and then we'll move on to housing and land supply. Uh, right in front of you. Right in front of you. Yep, sure, OK. Uh, we just need a, hold on, we just need a mic for you. Oh, you sure. got one? Yeah, I've got one. Excellent. <laughs> so um, my name's Nick Reno. I'm a homeowner. And uh, I'm insured with uh, AMI, so it's now Southern Response. And I've been, my, my rebuild has been on hold for, since February. Um, I've been given a range of reasons, uh, none in writing despite requesting it. But my question is this, the latest reason I've been given is that Southern Response cannot, res cannot progress rebuilds on the Port Hills without foundation guidelines from MB. And what I want to know is, is this true? And if so, when will the guidelines be released? Okay, so um, Port Hills are probably the most challenging area of the city to deal with for yeah. lots of reasons. Uh, but I'm going to ask Dave Kelly to give us an update on where MB are at with those guidelines. Uh, and uh, I think, where are we at with uh, that other release? On Wednesday. On Wednesday of this week, there'll be another report released that uh, the council have had um, uh, undertaken by GNS uh, to have a look at some of the other potential risks that might be there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's been really instructive for me is learning that Canterbury has all over it a number of survey pegs. And in any given uh, two or three year period, uh, the earth around those pegs can move by anything up to 50 millimetres. Uh, so we live in a, the land is always dynamic, it always moves. It's why, you know, rivers are in different places 100 years after a photograph is taken of them, that type of thing. Um, so similarly with the Port Hills, we had to know what the, uh, the, the potential movement was and how you uh, would build to uh, compensate for that movement. So Dave, if you want to... Yeah, Indicate. just briefly. Um, so MB has been working closely with Christchurch City Council and GNS to understand what the issues are in the Port Hills. And um, apart from um, a lot of the work that an expert panel has done, we've looked at about a hundred sites on the Port Hills to understand exactly how their existing foundations performed. So it's not a theoretical model; it's grounded more in reality. Um, so we're, we're close to issuing those. We're now just talking to the various insurance companies, their insurers, uh, sorry, their engineers, to make sure they understand it and test it a bit m more. Um, but we should have those guidelines out by the end of November this month. OK. Um, oh. Look, can, can I just make the point, too, that uh, you know, sometimes it's the time that uh, we reflect back on that. It's easy to forget that we had two years of pretty significant ground movements here. And so getting to that stable point 
uh, where some of the investigations that these guys have been doing, uh, some of the extraordinarily innovative stuff that's going on uh, in, in, in experimenting uh, at the present time, I think um, it really couldn't have happened too much sooner. But look, is there anything now that any of the insurers who've uh, come to Christchurch want to, want to say this evening? Just uh, invite Jackie Johnson. Um, now Jackie has, uh, through the Insurance Council, represented most insurers. Gary Dradesfield's here as well. Do you want to speak, Gary? Or? OK, yeah. yeah. Jackie. You know, it's really delightful to be here, and certainly myself and the colleagues actually do spend a lot of time in Christchurch. I can give you that commitment. We also, between ourselves as CEOs of the private insurers and all the government authorities, do meet every fortnight to actually go through very tactical issues, things that we probably wouldn't normally do in the leadership roles we hold. But I can give you my commitment that we do spend a lot of time across organisations dealing with exactly the issues you're, you're calling out tonight. And certainly from our perspective, we wanted to hear from you tonight as well, so it has been very useful. But there is also another point that I would like to leave with everyone. Our commitment is broader than just the rebuild of Christchurch. It's about a safe and sustainable rebuild. And it's about making sure that if we're the highest insured country in the world against the size of our country, our job is to leave that as a legacy, that we don't have a situation that's been called out tonight where certain properties can't get insurance in the future, because that would be irresponsible to put this community in a worse position than before the earthquake. So you've got all of our commitments that that's the sort of thing that we're juggling as well, and we're spending a lot of time with our reinsurers to keep their commitment to this country when we're about 0.05% of their premiums in the world, and also making sure that they're aware of the issues and how they can actually help. A lot of our policies had the option in the early days to just cash out. Gary and I, in particular, have led a lot of disaster recovery in Australia. And I can tell you when communities are left on their own and that we don't front up and work through the solutions, then that actually is a devastating thing for the resilience of a community. So they're just the key messages I'd like to leave, that you have absolutely our commitment jointly of everyone that's up here on the podium to be actively working together. We've done that for three years and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary Drainsfield from uh, uh, Vero. I'm sure I won't be as, uh, as eloquent as Jackie, but all I just wanted to add, I, I guess, were a couple of key things. Um, you can take some comfort, though it's probably cold comfort when you're living in a difficult situation and you're part of the percentage whose claim is not resolved, but you can take comfort that, you know, all of our people and, and probably across the, the insurance sector, you know, including EQC, you know, there's probably, a, probably something of the order of 10,000 people working on processing and handling claims before you get to builders. Uh, and project managers and, and other people in our value ch chain to try and, and resolve claims. Um, but all of those people are absolutely focused on trying to get an outcome for you. Um, and again, it may not seem it, um, and it may not give you any comfort hearing me say it, there is no benefit to insurers in trying to get out of it cheaply. A lot of the money that, that um, you know, we're trying to put into to rebuilding and settling claims is coming from, and the vast bulk of it is coming from, places like Munich and Zurich, London, Bermuda, uh, Singapore and other capital markets around the world where, where the reinsurance capital comes from. And as Jackie said, we've got to represent the reinsurer interests. And, and, and look, Mr Catamala, I take your point. Um, people didn't buy insurance from reinsurers, they bought it from insurers. And we went and bought some insurance from reinsurers so that we could offer the, the, the breadth of capacity that, uh, that the minister talked about that New Zealand's got for earthquake cover. But we have to pay those claims in the, in, the, in the terms of the policy coverage we've provided you, um, and we need to be able to demonstrate that to, to reinsurers. So the tension for us is doing that as quickly as we can. As I said, I give you the undertaking that no one that works in the insurance industry is not trying to get claims solved. There is no benefit to us uh, in terms of um, additional profit by delaying, uh, because the bulk of that money is coming from reinsurers. And we just want to get it from them and turn it into repaired and rebuilt houses and settled claims. So as I said, I know that's cold comfort when you're living in a difficult situation and you're one of the percentage that aren't settled, but as I said, that's, that's absolutely what we're trying to do.